five African countries, five West African countries collaborating to capture the data from 12 world herbaria, capture those data that are relevant to West Africa, process and digitize those data in West Africa, quality control the data, georeference the data, and then return the data to the institutions that hold the specimens under some understanding that those institutions will then make those data available globally, particularly to West Africa. And so that's going to rely on this sort of technique. If you did it by hand, if you did it without these, these assists from technology, it would take too long. It would not be feasible. Um, a still harder uh, task is to deal with three-dimensional collections. And the big nightmare in the biodiversity world is insects. Because they're small, collections are huge, and then worst of all, an insect specimen is a pin that goes down through the insect and then has a stack of tags. Sometimes it'll be five or ten tags, and each tag has one little bit of information. And they're written in this microscopic script. I could never be an entomologist just because I can't see and write that small. So the technology assists get even better. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a short series of slides from an initiative within Brazil. Um, I've had the good fortune to be connected with this initiative a bit. Um, but this is the Virtual Herbarium of Flora and Fungi of Brazil. It's a National Institute of Brazil. So it's a National, sorry, National Virtual Institute of Brazil. Um, it connects a huge number of uh, collections. And so you can very easily do a query. This was for some plant. And from each of these collections, we could see this total number of records. So there were 81 records in total. And then there were two forms of georeferencing. And so you can see for 60 of the 80, there was a, a latitude-longitude coordinate pair. Um, there's some information about the content and the format. But then there's also the ability to map the data and the, this is really exciting, which I'll show you in just a moment. It's uh, photographs. So, you know, one of the things we'll be talking about later in the week, officially in a separate course, we'll be talking about doing species descriptions. And one of the biggest constraints on being able to do those descriptions, you know, here in Cameroon, you have the biodiversity right here. You have some access to the literature, not global, not ideal, but some access. But in many cases, what you need to do is to take your specimen, it might be a bird, it might be a moth, it might be a plant, you need to take your specimen and put it right next to the type specimen. And we'll talk about what types are. Um, but that type specimen Sometimes it's just lost, in which case you can't make that comparison. And sometimes it's sitting in a museum in Britain or in the US or what have you. And in that case, you really end up waiting until you can go and make that comparison or a friend can make that comparison. And that ends up being a huge bottleneck in this process. These images are not a replacement for actually looking at the specimen, but they can make a huge difference. They're very high quality images. And so in a situation like this, I pulled up a holotype and a paratype. But using the software tools of the virtual herbarium, you could put up your specimen here next to the holotype. And these are images that are taken with very, very good precision. So you can zoom in and you can look at 
at least some of the, the mesostructure, if not the microstructure of the plant. So this is a very exciting time where we start to make museums that used to be in a single building, in a single city, in a single country, we start to make those global. Um, this is far afield from the topic of this course, but there are other technology assists. So there are now um, um, facilities, software facilities and internet facilities that allow us to georeference um, localities in an automated or semi-automated way. So this is, um, this is in Brazil and we fed in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. So you all know Rio de Janeiro as a city, which is actually down here, right here. Um, but it's also a state. And I kind of figured that out because it says five kilometers north of Teresópolis. And Teresópolis is a, is a city up in the mountains of Rio de Janeiro state. So feeding, ah, sorry, feeding that string into this facility, essentially the facility came out with three different interpretations of that string of text. Okay? It was pretty easy to figure out that that was not Rio de Janeiro city because then there would be two cities in the string. So if that's the state, then the next question is whether Teresópolis is a city within that state. Answer, yes. So then, five kilometers north, that's pretty easy. But the question can be, what is Teresópolis? Okay, is it a point? It's actually a polygon because Teresópolis is a medium-sized city. And so the, you can essentially come up with a number of different interpretations. And that's where we jump between full automation, which is to say just feed all of the localities in Cameroon or all of the localities in Brazil into a facility like this and take the latitude longitude as it comes out. Or we probably want a supervisory step where somebody who knows the region and maybe even knows the taxon can step in and look and say, hey, I'm guessing it's actually B and not A or C. And so we can automate or we can semi-automate this process, um, but it's a lot faster than doing it by hand, okay? Other technology assists come out of sharing the data. So if we have data in three or four herbaria around Cameroon, obviously those herbarium sheets are wonderful and rich documentation of the plants of Cameroon, but they become more when we put the data together. Okay, and they become still more when we put the data together and allow other people around the world, scientists, to access those data and play with the data. So that's what's been done in Brazil. And so this is the species link network that is the basis for the virtual herbarium. Species link does animals as well as plants and fungi. Um, and this is essentially the raw data from species link. And there's some things that you should see in here. Obviously that's Brazil. So that's that makes sense. Most of the data, where you see darker, warmer colors, that's a lot of data records. And where you see light colors, that's few data records. And where you see the background, that's zero. And so you can see most of the data in these Brazilian institutions is in Brazil. That's good. There's some data up into Venezuela and Colombia and Peru and Argentina. That's to be expected. There's some marine data, and indeed there are collections of marine algae and, and marine plants and marine fishes and things like that, so that's good. 
So can anybody tell me what this is? Notice that there's not intense sampling, but there's some sampling along the east coast of Africa and then broadly out into the Indian Ocean. Anybody have an idea of what that is? Don't answer. <laughs> Anybody work with GIS? Okay, I see some hands. You guys got to start asking questions. When you represent the eastern hemisphere, this hemisphere in GIS, you use a positive longitude. When you represent our side of the world in GIS, you use a negative longitude. Well, if you make a mistake and forget the negative sign before a Brazilian longitude, you get this. So here is the prime meridian, and notice that this is the shape of Brazil reflected across the prime meridian, just like that. And so that is places where people in the Western Hemisphere forgot that we are on the negative side of the world. Okay? And in fact, you will also sometimes see it reflected like this and like this because we mess up the signs amongst other hemispheres. So that's one thing that you see from this immediately, that we have some problems with longitude data. You can also see this line and this line. Anybody have an idea what those are? Well, that looks like it goes through London, so I'm guessing it's the prime meridian. Yeah. And this is the equator. So how do you generate that error? If either latitude or longitude, instead of having the correct value, is just put at zero. So sometimes people represent missing data with a zero. They should represent missing data with a missing datum, right? But we frequently get you know, a latitude-longitude pair that might be you know, 32, 20, but the 20 gets lost and it becomes a zero, and so that generates these crosses, okay? And they're usually centered right on um, zero, zero. And so now there are software tools that essentially allow us to pick out these errors and think about them. So this is still this Brazilian project, Species Link, and this, um, this is essentially a diagnostic of one collection. And I don't know if you guys have seen this, but back when I was little, you would sometimes see like government documents that were released that were, I think the word is redacted, where they've blacked out the names of individuals and things like that. So I, I blacked out the name of the collection just to not make anybody feel bad. Uh, this collection serves 235,000 records. And then all of the rest of this is a diagnostic. And so of the 235,000 records, 158,000 have no coordinates. So right away you see this is a collection that could benefit hugely from a georeferencing effort. Um, these 873 records are in the ocean. Maybe that's fine. You know, I help run a bird collection and most of our specimens are on land. Some of them are from the water, that's fine. But if you say, oh no, 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 we're a terrestrial collection, then those records from the ocean are probably errors. Um, you can look at repeated er uh, records, so like, if there are two records with the same catalog number. Catalog numbers are supposed to be unique. Or there's 1,809 records where the entire record is repeated. All of the data are the same. 
Those are just errors. So the, and then there are outliers in terms of uh, country. There are uh, latitude and longitude are the same number, which does happen, but not frequently. And so for each of these categories of reasons why you should worry, you can, oh, sorry, get a diagnostic. So this is a diagnostic through time of just the number of records. And so you can see this collection did a big init initial digitization push and then accumulated records at a slower pace through time. But then these are suspicious genera. You know, just genera that maybe weren't on an authority list. And so you can see they built up 2,000 or more records that had suspicious genera, and then somebody went through and worked on the data and cleaned the data up, and then 10 or 11,000 records accumulated that had suspicious genera, and then somebody went in and cleaned those up. And so this is what Mark and I have been doing together for 21 years, where you look at the catalog, you say, you know, we've got a mess in this field. Maybe we should go through and do some cleaning. And that cleaning produces this. Or here for duplicate records, they had built up quite a large number of duplicate records, probably by some database duplication error, and then somebody went in and cleaned it up. So these tools really are a huge assist in curation of collections. So that's all internal housekeeping, right? That's getting the data better and better. But it still doesn't solve those problems that Dr. Mafani mentioned of access. You're here in Cameroon. There's unique biodiversity all over this country, but especially right here in your backyard. And all the information is sitting on another continent. So a next step is to integrate and share those data. Species Link in Brazil integrates 250 collections. I think the number is quite a bit higher now. 5.2 records, 5.2 million records online that correspond to almost 400,000 species. Uh, this is what the network looks like. So the center is in uh, a little city called Campinas. Little meaning several million people. But each of these points on the map is a node that contributes data to their national network. And their national network contributes data to the global network. 